Come back for part five, will Hillary and Bill Clinton be indicted? Also, be sure to like, subscribe, click the bell for notifications, and share this video. Thanks. Welcome back to part four of JFK Jr.'s George Magazine, February 1997 edition. I know you're all excited to hear about the lung infecting virus that was predicted in 1997 for the year 2020. Was it predicted by Bill Gates? Let's find out. This is a continuation of Platform 2020, a survival guide to the future. Disease. Killer cooties. Now, 25 years ago, many experts said that antibiotics and vaccines would soon make infectious diseases a plague of the past. Yet for every disease conquered, such as smallpox, a new one has emerged. AIDS, Lyme disease, Ligonier's disease, toxic shock syndrome, Ebola, E. coli, and each time a disease has been brought under control, another has resurfaced. Diphtheria in Russia, cholera, and dang hemorrhagic fever in Latin America, malaria, and drug-resistant tuberculosis in American inner cities. New illnesses have a number of sources. Human contact with microbes from other species, AIDS for example, which came from African monkeys, changes in the environment, Lyme disease from reforestation and suburban development, new technology, Ligonier's disease from air conditioning and water heating systems, microbial mutations, toxic shock syndrome, and their adaption to antibiotics, drug-resistant tuberculosis. 2020. For decades to come, the toll of infections will be worse in poor and unstable nations, but new diseases will continue to appear in the prosperous ones as they have for decades. America will have aged and age brings greater risk of infection. People over 60 will benefit, perhaps more than others, from advances in medicine, but they will face new threats as well. Cancer treatment and organ transplants will be more successful, although one resulting problem may be greater vulnerability to infections after surgery. As more people live longer, they will spend more time in hospitals and nursing homes exposed to the drug-resistant microbes. Some people have built careers hawking the worst-case scenario, an overpopulated planet being choked to death by lung-attacking Andromeda viruses, for example. It's true that frightening global epidemics could arise from an, a new retrovirus, a killer flu, or an Ebola-type pathogen running out of control. Because our technology and our behavior have sped up microbial evolution, reducing the threat of new plagues will demand thoughtful efforts. Slowing population growth, keeping our food and water clean, and setting up global systems to monitor infectious diseases and microbial drug resistance, for instance. Human extinction, however, is unlikely, not least because the human immune system is a marvel of resourcefulness. Infection is a universal fact of nature, and microbes share the environment with us. For some microbes, we are the environment. The greatest threat may not be microbes, but our failure to protect ourselves. So we know Bill Gates didn't say that in this issue. But we do know that in 2015, at a TED Talk, he spoke of a pandemic that would take place in the next decade and kill 30 million people. And then there's Dr. F. He stated, and I quote, there will be a challenge to the coming administration in the area of infectious diseases. Both chronic infectious diseases, in the sense of already ongoing disease, and we certainly have a large burden of that, but also there will be a surprise outbreak. And then there was event 201, just saying. All right, let's move on. Sex and drugs. Microbicides and Prozac. Now, sex, as everybody knows, can be dangerous and will, it will only get worse. According to the Institute of Medicine, sexually transmitted diseases are the hidden epidemic, the driving force behind the spread of HIV in the heterosexual community, as well as the reason for the surging rates of tubal pregnancy, infertility, and cervical cancer. Non-HIV sexual diseases cost taxpayers $10 billion annually, according to the Institute, but the public sector spends only $1 for 
to prevent STDs for every $43 spent on treatment and other costs. We spend less in real dollars today on STDs than we did in 1950, says Peggy Clark, president of the American Social Health Association. As for illicit drugs, teen use has almost doubled since 1991, according to the University of Michigan's Monitoring the Future study, and there's no shortage of blame. Bill Clinton, Nancy Reagan, the CIA, Snoop Doggy Dog, 1960s parents, depraved youth. In the meantime, Jails are overflowing with nonviolent drug offenders while rapists wait for vacancies and governors scramble to pay for more prisons. If recent polls and new state laws are any indication, the time is ripe for drug policy reform. In 1996, voters in California and Arizona approved legalizing certain drugs such as marijuana for medical use and in Arizona they even agreed to replace jail sentences with rehab for petty drug offenders. 2020. Dr. Felicia Stewart, Director of Reproductive Health at the Kaiser Family Foundation, foresees a day when all of us will carry a date decision maker, a sort of magic eight ball with a built-in sweat sensor to detect whether a person has an STD. Get your potential partner to palm the sensor and a digital message will let you know whether you should proceed. If you forget your magic eight ball, a simple home-based STD test will render a quick verdict the morning after. There will be a code on your toothbrush that says, get a chlamydia checkup today, says Stewart. Also, the Department of Health and Human Services recently dedicated $100 million to research microbicides, gels that kill sperm, HIV, and STDs while keeping reproductive organs intact. In the year 2020, microbicides will be part of the daily regimen, like deodorant. On the drug front, according to Drug Strategies, a nonprofit think tank Future prevention efforts will be based on developing kids' confidence using peer-led role-playing techniques to help them say no to drugs. Meanwhile, grown-ups may be saying yes to performance-enhancing drugs. Prozac has become more culturally acceptable, says Ethan Nadelman, director of the Lynn Smith Center, a drug policy and research institute. As these drugs improve, we may see employers preferring to hire people who take these drugs. Nadelman also sees greater acceptance of psychedelic drugs, citing the federal government's recent decision to resume a long, mothballed study of LSD as a treatment for alcoholics, and acceptance of stimulants such as low-dose cocaine and coca tea, which is widely consumed in Bolivia and is considered no more dangerous than caffeine. Warfare. Really smart weapons. Now. Techies designing the weapons of tomorrow are looking for ways to wage war while keeping their troops out of harm's way. The buzz in the air is what the Pentagon calls unmanned aerial vehicles. Using radar and sensors to scan the earth below, these drones, now limited to spy missions, can loiter over an area for hours, an assignment too risky for human pilots. Bombing runs sans pilots could be 20 years away. Trekkers take note. Airborne lasers to jumble enemy electronics are only a decade away. Inspired by Ronald Reagan's Star Wars dream, the Pentagon is also at work on a handful of schemes to blast incoming missiles out of the sky. An interceptor fired from an airplane could be ready by 2005. Over in the Navy's yard, the pet project is the Arsenal ship, a floating fortress. Commanders miles away could launch the ship's 500 missiles deep into enemy territory. With a crew of just 50, this futuristic dreadnought will be far cheaper than conventional fighting vessels. The demo model could be in the water by 2000. The Army thinks its silver bullet may be a digitized battlefield. The plan is to wire all the good guys with communications and mapping devices that would give them the location of friend and foe alike. 2020. One thing is certain about war in the future. It will take place on new battlefields. One of them almost surely will be outer space, warns Andrew F. Krepinovich, Jr., who, as director of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments in Washington, D.C., maps out detailed scenarios of potential future wars. A nuclear Iran closes off the Strait of Hormuz in 2016. Whom America will be fighting is harder to predict. Maybe another superpower such as China, or the U.S. might weigh in on civil wars and regional disputes in, for example, the Middle East or between Koreas. North Korea is developing a ballistic missile that has a range of 
2,170 miles and could threaten Alaska and Hawaii within a decade. Whatever the case may be, sensors in space, on planes, and on the ground would deliver a crystalline view of any conflict, and the details would be fed to more precise versions of the Gulf War's smart weapons. Long-range missiles and armed drones will handle many of the tasks of today's tanks and fighter planes, so Uncle Sam may need fewer good men and women. But smaller ground forces may still be needed to lay claim to cities and in particular, strategic sites such as skyscrapers and tunnels. Rogue warriors will become more dangerous, armed with chemical and biological weapons, ballistic missile systems, cheap satellite imaging, and pinpoint navigation systems. They could also be dangerous in cyberspace, where an attack on computer systems could disrupt the nation and disable the military, a sort of real-life version of the movie War Games. Food. Takeout is in. Now, here on the cusp of the millennium, you can walk into a supermarket in a Midwest city and buy enoki mushrooms, Thai peanut sauce, and baby arugula. But every day, 7% of Americans eat at McDonald's. Hundreds of new products are low or non-fat. Yet, young Americans have gained 8 pounds in the last 10 years. And while scientists have engineered healthier foods, pork that is about 30% leaner and eggs that have less cholesterol, serving sizes have nearly doubled in the last 30 years, canceling out any waistline benefits. Federal efforts to improve our diets have failed. Introduced in the early 1990s for battles with meat and dairy lobbies, the USDA's Revised Food Guideline Pyramid recommends at least five total daily servings of fruits and vegetables, but average consumption remains stubbornly at about three and a half servings perhaps in part because the same year that the National Cancer Institute spent $400,000 to promote the new guidelines, Kellogg spent $1 million to advertise just one cereal, Sugar Frosted Flakes. Mm. To add to the confusion, the rich have swapped diets with the poor. Before the wealthy learned to revere a third world diet of grains and vegetables, they gorged on meats, cheese, and sweets. These days, the poor are also dying of the so-called diseases of affluence, such as diabetes, stroke, and heart disease. 2020. Two factors will always matter most in food selection, price and convenience. As a result, Harry Balzer, a consumer marketing researcher based in Illinois, guesses that hamburgers will rank, as they have since at least 1975, among the top three favorite restaurant entrees. But the most salient point about the future of food, it seems, will not be what we're eating, but who is preparing it. Cooking at home is likely to be reduced entirely to hobby status. The kitchen will be the great recreation spot, claims Clark Wolf, a New York-based food and restaurant consultant. The vast majority of daily meals will be prepared by professionals to be taken home or delivered, perhaps to specially designed refrigerated drop-off slots in the facades of homes. Is a prepared food society a sign of cultural decline or a scheduling triumph for people who have better things to do than chop and saute, says Balzer, who has studied the increase in takeout eating. We'd be moving in a direction we all want to go in, toward having our own cook. Well, there you go, folks. Come back for part five, will Hillary and Bill Clinton be indicted? Also, be sure to like, subscribe, click the bell for notifications, and share this video. Thanks.